welcome intrepid historians. So we started Friday's class with a, a sample multiple choice question from the test we took the day before. If you want to hit pause and, and think this over, uh, you can. Um, and and then we sort of talked through um, answers, right? Like uh, spread of corn cultivation. Hmm, that sounds really tempting given that uh, corn was first cultivated in ancient times in uh, Mesoamerica, uh, Mesoamerica, and then spread northward into North America and became a staple crop uh, wherever it could be grown throughout the continent. Because the question is asking about stuff before 1492, smallpox epidemics, this is clearly a non-starter because smallpox is brought uh, in the Columbian Exchange by Europeans. Also, regular contacts with Africa are also a consequence of the Columbian Exchange, so not before 1492. Spoked wheel, never invented by ancient or medieval American civilizations. Uh, it also is brought along with the Columbian Exchange. Domestication of horses, not possible before 1492, as Paleo-Indians ate all the horses at the end of the last Ice Age, and horses were therefore extinct in the Americas until reintroduced by Europeans after 1492. So, A is the answer. Oh, and then I went over uh, grade repair options, which are... Um, largely moot at this point, and I refer to the fact that I now have a textbook reading schedule in Google Classroom, so at any uh, given time you know exactly what um, you should read. The way to do this is, um, you know, on this day you should show up in class having read chapter one if you're in the blue textbook or chapter one if you're in the brown textbook. Um, they start together, but they, they diverge, right, because um, the, they're different books. Anyhow, uh, we, ra we ended last time on the uh, freedom of the press triumph of John Peter Zenger, um, which opens the door for uh, Benjamin Franklin uh, as a... Um, Benjamin Franklin was a newspaper guy. He uh, started out uh, as a publisher. That's how he made his fortune and uh, gained his fame. And he used his platform as a newspaper publisher, publishing the Pennsylvania Gazette, the leading newspaper of that colony, and also Poor Richard's Almanac, a publication that was disseminated throughout the colonies. Franklin used this platform to popularize the intellectual movement of the Enlightenment, which we talked about before in connection with uh, Thomas Hobbes and John Locke and their concept of a state of nature and the social contract, which under Locke, uh, around the time of the Glorious Revolution uh, develops into a concept of people having natural rights to life, liberty, and property. Well, Franklin digs all that stuff, so along with disseminating news, he's also promoting the scientific discoveries of the scientific revolution, and he's promoting Enlightenment philosophy. Enlightenment, uh, the Enlightenment changed the way some people, including Franklin and Jefferson and other founders, thought about religion. Some Enlightenment thinkers uh, embraced a, a new religious concept called deism. Now, deism was really a rejection of traditional Christianity. The, they were trying to come up with a sort of scientific approach to religion. And so they, they had a really different concept of God, um, which I'm calling a remote watchmaker god, actually. I'm not just calling it that. They they wrote about uh, that. Um, you know, in traditional um, Christianity, God is you know a personal God. He um, is willing to help uh, people pray and hope that God will sort of uh, uh, bend reality to uh, to help them. And the deists, people like Franklin, they're like that. We don't believe it works that way. That doesn't sound scientific to us. They believed that God had created a perfect universe. They likened it to a watch because a, a watch, you know, old school watch where you wind it up and um, and the watch tells time by itself. That's how they thought God made the universe, that God made this complex universe that operates according to scientific laws 
and God wound it up at the beginning of time and let it go, and God is just straight chilling, uh, lying back. Um, things are unfolding, and um, you know God is distant. He is not interfering. There's no point in praying to God and asking him to change reality to help you. That's not how it works. Uh, our job, according to Franklin and other deists, is to pay attention to uh, the perfection of God's creation, to learn the scientific laws of the universe, and then to behave uh, in accordance with those laws. Um, that's, that's how you make uh, the universe work for yourself. Um, God helps those who help themselves is an aphorism that Franklin uh, concocted that is uh, consonant, uh, consistent with uh, deist thinking that um, you know we uh, we're wasting time if we're wearing, wearing out our knees, uh, you know, praying for help. We just need to get up and do it for ourselves. Enlightenment um, deist thinkers like Franklin and Jefferson also had a different explanation for evil. Uh, traditional Christianity believed that evil was a result uh, of Satan, of demonic influence. And deists, again, thought that wasn't very scientific. They believed that evil was really a consequence of ignorance, people not knowing any better. And if people had better information, if people had better education, then they would be able to make better decisions. They would, they would not just be smarter people, but they'd be better people. If they knew better, they would do better. And you know, so this helps us, helps us understand why Franklin is devoting his life to disseminating information, uh, including scientific information. He believes that he's making humanity better in, in the process. Now, deism was something that elite intellectuals like Franklin and Jefferson dug on. Um, it, you know, despite Franklin's efforts to popularize Enlightenment concepts, um, he doesn't make much of a dent on religion, uh, per se. Most folks are going in a totally different direction, and the bulk of today's lesson is going to be about that, about how in the 1730s and 1740s there was an event in colonial America called the Great Awakening, now, I've here defined the Great Awakening as a series of pietist revivals that swept Britain and the 13 colonies, also hit Germany uh, around this time. Of course, we're going to focus on the Great Awakening and the 13 colonies because this is American history. Now, the problem with that definition is you might not know what a pietist is, uh, although statistically it is likely that many of the people listening to me right now are in fact pietists and just maybe don't know um, that that is a term that describes them. Um, pietism is a flavor of Protestant Christianity that emerges in northern Germany in the late 1600s. The, you know, first you had you know, Lutherans, uh, and then later on, um, down in Switzerland and France, you get the Calvinists. Um, so you have a sort of, uh, you know, the moderate Lutheran brand of, of Protestantism, and then you have the, the stricter Calvinist concept, and then uh, a third variety emerges. Pietists are, um, the, the easiest way to understand them is to say pietists are born-again Christians. Um, now, they're not exactly the same as today's born-again Christians, because um, other, uh, you know, today's born-again Christians are influenced by later concepts that emerged in the 1800s and in the 20th century. We'll talk about those things when we get there. This is not our, our last dance with religion in this course. Religion it plays an important role in American history. But anyhow, so pietists believe that the problem with Catholics, the problem with Lutherans, the problem with Calvinists is that their religion is routine and dull and, um, and uninspiring. The, you know, they were looking for a more passionate uh, religious experience. They thought that routine was deadening and that, um, you know, I, I like to think of it as like the, the race between the tortoise and the hare. They, they thought the, um, you know, the Catholics and the Lutherans and the Calvinists were like uh, slow plodding tortoises in their religious journey. You know, babies get baptized, they get raised in the faith, they go to church all their life. It's a process of learning. 
um, you know, how to be a good Christian, wh how, what you're supposed to believe, how you're supposed to act, and then eventually they die, you know, and whatever. Boring. Um, the pietists want to, uh, want to get there fast. The pietists believe, um, you know, the largest uh, group then and now of pietists uh, is the Baptists, right? So, um, and Baptist is a funny name for that church because the Baptists uh, actually are against baptizing babies. Um, you know, in, in every other Christian tradition to date, uh, you know, baptizing babies was normal. Um, but the Baptists are like, nope, baptizing babies, waste of time. Babies are stupid. Their brains are mush. Uh, sprinkling water on a baby no, no more makes it a Christian than sprinkling water on a fence post makes the fence post Christian. They believe... Uh, you know, pietists, Baptists believe that you got to wait till someone reaches the age of understanding, right? Like late in childhood or maybe in their teen years, maybe in their young adult years, someone finally gets it, right? They, they understand Christianity conceptually in their brain, uh, who God is, who Jesus is, um, what, uh, Christians are, what Christians are supposed to believe and how they're supposed to act. And at that point, there's this spark of inspiration and the Holy Spirit enters the person uh, for the first time in their life and fundamentally transforms them. They are born again. They are a Christian. Um, and hopefully they're a Christian once and for all, right? And yet, um, occasionally, um, you know, in pietist tradition, there will be backsliding. People's faith will slacken and they're in need of a pep talk. That's what a revival is. A revival is like a, um, a spiritual uh, pep rally, um, you know, a new preacher comes to town, maybe, and gives a rousing sermon and reminds everybody what it's all about. So, so that, in a nutshell, is what a pietist is. And, folks, I'm here to tell you that Christianity was in crisis in the colonial era. Now, that might strike you as surprising because, you know, while most people who came to the 13 colonies came for economic reasons, there were some who came for religious reasons, right? We saw several colonies founded for religious reasons, Maryland by the Catholics, New England colonies by the Puritans, um, the Rhode Island um, by people seeking religious freedom, uh, Pennsylvania by the Quakers. And so you, you might have assumed that, you know, there's this, you know, thriving religious vibe going on in the 13 colonies. And there, there really wasn't. There was like a strong start in those colonies I just mentioned, but then a whole lot of fade. Um, you know, we talked about the, the sort of slackening of Puritan faith in New England, and the halfway covenant and so forth, but the problem was more general than that. It had to do with a severe shortage of clergy. Um, now, clergy um, are religious professionals, priests and ministers, right? People whose full-time job is to serve God and to teach people about God. And this was really a supply problem. There weren't a lot of places uh, in the 13 colonies where people could learn to be priests and ministers. In fact, there was just one. The Puritans had set up uh, Harvard College to train Puritan ministers. And so the Puritans in New England were kind of set. They had a, a, a decent, steady supply of Puritan clergy. But everywhere else in the 13 colonies and, and all the other different churches, severe shortage because you know they're basically counting on people to get educated back in Britain or elsewhere in Europe, and then out of the goodness of their heart, come and rough it on the frontier in the 13 colonies. And you know what? Not a lot of clergy wanted to do that. Um, if you, you go through all the trouble of getting educated and ready to serve as a, a cleric, as a priest or a minister, um, you know, they were much happier doing that in the safety of a city or town in Europe. And so there's a persistent shortage of clergy, thus uh, a shortage of religious services. And um, so in the next installment, I will talk to you about circuit riders, uh, a method of, of dealing with that.